Greetings, RISC-V processor friends. So with the register card built and somewhat tested, but not entirely tested, I thought it would be nice to move on to perhaps the next phase in the project, which is talking about arithmetic and logical instructions. So let's set the registers aside for now. And let's talk about the register register instructions. Now I'm going to draw out the R instruction format. And for the register register instructions, the opcode is always 011001. Uh, the destination register is whatever it is, it's 5 bits. Same thing with the source register. So we've got 5 bits here and 5 bits there. And func7, well, the lowest 5 bytes are always zeros. The second to the last byte is a little bit special, and the last bit, the last bit is 0. func3 tells us what operation we're going to perform. So a 0, 0, 0 is either an add or a subtract, depending on the value of this bit right over here. So if it's a 0, then it's an add. And if it's a 1, then the operation is a subtract. And subtract means source register 1 minus source register 2, not the other way around. For 0, 0, 1, this is shift left logical. So we're going to shift it to the left this way. We're shifting in zeros, and the bits on the most significant end just sort of fall off. They don't actually get stored anywhere, unlike in other processor architectures. And the number of shifts that you do is determined by RS2. So this is RS1 shifted left by RS2. And it's not, of course, all of RS2. You can only shift 32 positions, so we only pay attention to the low five bits of RS2. So the next operation, 0, 1, 0, is set if less than. And what we do is we do a signed comparison between RS1 and check if it's less than RS2. If it is, then we put a 1 in the destination register. Otherwise, we put 0 in the destination register. And there's also 0, 1, 1, which is sh uh, set if less than unsigned. So again, we do RS1 is less than RS2, but this is an unsigned comparison. And the difference, of course, between signed and unsigned is that in signed, you use two's complement notation, and then you get negative numbers and positive numbers. So for example, uh, for set if less than unsigned, if you had, for example, hex FF is less than zero, the answer would be no, because that would be 255 is less than zero. However, if you did a signed comparison, FF in 2's complement is negative 1, and negative 1 is less than 0. So with the same registers, SLT and SLTU will give you different results, depending on whether you're doing signed or unsigned. OK, then we get um, a logical operation. This is 1, 0, 0, and this is just XOR. So we just take RS1 and XOR it with RS2 and put it in the destination. I guess for completeness, I should just do this. Um, we have 101, which is shift right logical. And this is RS1 shift right logical. I'm going to use the Java notation here. And what this does is it shifts the bit over to the right. And again, we only pay attention to the lowest five bits of RS2. 
Now what shift right logical means is that we're shifting zeros into the most significant bit, and on the least significant bit they just fall off and disappear. There's also shift right arithmetic, which I'm going to symbolize like this. And the difference between shift right arithmetic and shift right logical is that the sign bit, which is the most significant bit, is retained. So we're not actually shifting anything into the most significant bit, we're shifting the most significant bit into the most significant bit. So if you have one and then a whole bunch of zeros and then you shift it arithmetically right, you're going to end up with one, one, and then a whole bunch of zeros. And that is simply signed division. So it's basically treating this as a signed number. Shift right arithmetic is encoded in the same way as shift right logical. And the difference is this bit again. So a zero bit means shift right logical. And a one bit means shift right arithmetic. Then we have 110, which is OR. So this is RS1 logical ORed with RS2. So it's just bitwise OR. And 111 is, you probably guessed it, AND. This is bitwise AND. OK, so those are the register register instructions. Taking two registers and putting the result in the destination register. Now, one of the interesting things that you might have noticed is that there's no register register move instruction. In other words, I can't just take RS1 and move it into the destination. And I can't take RS2 and just move it into the destination. But you might remember that register 0 is always 0. So you could, in theory, move RS1 into RD as long as you say that RS2 is 0. That's the equivalent. And this is one of the things that makes RISC-V a very RISC processor in that they basically said, well, if you can do something with one of these instructions, then we don't need to provide that other something. So we don't need to provide a move instruction. You can simply do it with add. If you wanted to, you could even add R0 to R0 and put the result in R0. Writing to R0 does absolutely nothing, and this is a single instruction. Well, that's a no-op. So RISC-V doesn't provide a no-op operation because you can do that with other instructions. OK, there's also uh, the other format of instruction, which is the register immediate instruction. And this is the I format of instruction. So you can see that it is pretty much identical to the R format, with the exception that there's no RS2 and func7. Instead, we replace that with a 12-bit immediate value. And this is always treated as a 12-bit signed immediate value. So the most significant bit is the sign bit. So the opcode for the register immediate instructions is 0010011. And if you compare it with the register register instructions, you'll see that really it only differs in this uh, fifth bit right over here, bit 5. So the functions are pretty much the same. We do have an add instruction. This one is called add i for add immediate, and that just takes rs1 and adds the signed immediate value. Now there is no subtract because, of course, why would you have a separate subtract instruction when you could simply do the negation of the immediate value yourself. So if you wanted to subtract 1, well, you would just add negative 1. And that's how you would do that. 0, 0, 1 is, again, shift logical left, immediate. So this is RS1 shifted by the immediate value. And again, we only pay attention to the lowest five bits. 0, 1, 0, set if less than. And again, this is a signed comparison between RS1 and the immediate. And then there is 0, 1, 1, which is a set if less than unsigned immediate. Now, this is a little strange because now we're dealing with unsigned numbers. So what happens is you take this number 
as a signed number and then sign extend it out to 32 bits. And all that means is that you take the most significant bit of that number and you just replicate it all the way to the end. And then you do an unsigned comparison. We also have XOR, so this is just RS1, XOR with the immediate value. And again, this is sign extended. So again, you take the most significant bit and you replicate it all the way to the end. We have 101, which is shift right logical, RS1, shift right logical. And again, you only pay attention to the low five bits. We have SRA, which is, uh, sorry, this is all immediate. We have shift right arithmetic, so that's RS1 shifted by the lowest five bits of the immediate value. And here, the encoding is the same for func3, except remember that over here, we had the second to last bit determine what it is. Well, here, we also have the second to the last bit determine what the operation is. If it's a zero, it's a logical shift. And if it's a one, it's an arithmetic shift. And the reason, of course, we can do that is that we only need the low five bits of the immediate value. All the rest are free to do whatever we want with, really. And then finally, there's one, one, zero, which is or immediate, RS1, ORD immediate, again, sign extended and 111, which is and I, RS1, and immediate, bitwise, sign extended. So um, in terms of this sign extended stuff, well, you know, this number over here would also be sign extended if you want to take a 32-bit number and also add another 32-bit number. So instead of this 12-bit number, you have a 32-bit number. It's just that you're sign extending this. Okay, so those are the register register instructions and those are the register immediate instructions. Now with these, I can uh, load some values, uh, certainly some low values um, into a register. So for example, if I wanted to load uh, an immediate number into the destination register, well, I just set register one to zero and that's adding zero plus the immediate and putting it in the destination. So again, you don't have a specific move a constant into a register uh, instruction. We have all of these instructions that we need to implement somehow. And the traditional way of doing that is with an ALU, an arithmetic and logical unit. Now, what I want to do is talk about the shifts separately. So I'm going to leave those aside for the moment. And I'm just going to talk about add, subtract, uh, the less than operations, and then the logical XOR, OR, and AND operations. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to draw the ALU as a box. And I'll call it a 32-bit ALU. And we're going to have a destination bus, which of course can go to the destination register. And that's a 32-bit bus. So there's 32 bits right there. We also have source one, which can come from uh, source register one. And we're going to put that as I'll just call it X, and that's also a 32-bit bus. And we have source two, which could come from source register two, or because both of these operations use source one, this immediate could be put on the source two bus. So first of all, we're going to want source two to go into the other 32-bit input of the ALU. And we're also going to want the ability to put, and this is just going to be maybe a buffer. 
So this could be, you know, we'll just call it the immediate buffer, and we can put the value of the immediate buffer onto source two. And where you get the immediate value, of course, is from the instruction. So we know, if we look at this, that the, we have 12 bits here for the immediate value. So we could just take instructions 11 to 0, or rather, that's not the instruction, it's instruction 31 through 20, and that becomes the immediate value 11 to 0. But remember that we're sign extending it, so we're simply going to take the 11th bit here, immediate of 11, and replicate it so that it's also immediate 31 down to 12. And that's just your immediate value. And then of course we have an output enable over here that will be enabled if the format of the instruction is i, which will depend on the opcode. Okay, so the next thing that the ALU traditionally needs is a carry in. And even though there is no flags register in RISC-V, we're still going to want a carry in. And I'll get to why in a moment. We'll also want an output, which is a carry out. And again, we'll get to why in a moment. We also want a function. And I'll just call that f. And the function is basically just this, um, except that here we have subtract and add look like the same function. Uh, we're ignoring the shifts, but you know maybe because we're ignoring the shifts, we could make sub become 0, 0, 001. In any case, these are the instructions or the operations that the ALU performs. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. So we have seven possible instructions or seven possible operations that can be encoded in three bits. So let's just say that that's three bits. We could expand it if we want later to have other types of operations that are not necessarily encoded in these instructions that can do maybe a little more complex things. Anyway, so what does this mean? Well, carry in is one and carry out is also one. We have 32 inputs. We have another 32 inputs. We have three inputs here and one input over here. Great. So the question becomes, how are we going to build this? Because as far as I know, there is no 32-bit uh, ALU chip that I can just throw in and be done with it. What we're going to do is we're going to travel back in time. And if I had my Lego DeLorean, I would do the little Lego DeLorean sweep and sing a little song. But since I don't, I'll just bring this here. So way back in uh, April of 1982, uh, Digital Equipment Corporation came out with the VAX 11 730 mainframe. This was a processor that was built totally out of TTL chips. Here is the central processing unit. This is the technical description. And I'm just going to skip to the section that describes the ALU. So we can see that they programmed their ALU. Now, I should mentioned that the VAX 11 was a 32-bit machine. Um, although, interestingly, it could take a minimum of one megabyte of memory and only a maximum of five megabytes of memory. So the 32 bits uh, actually referred to the data path and also the address path, but the VAX 11 had virtual addressing, that's what the VA stands for, and that meant that the virtual address could be anywhere in that 32-bit address space. Uh, but again, you only really had five megabytes of physical memory. Okay, anyway, so this is what the ALU could do. It could add, it could subtract, it could subtract in the other way. It could do an OR, it could do an AND, it could do an XOR. Well, that's actually pretty good because that's what we need, um, with the exception of our less than test. Um, it could also complement one of the um, inputs, but we're not doing that. So 
And here's a diagram. Okay. Now, what you should note is this ALU right over here. And what they do is they call this a microprocessor slice. So a, a, a bit sliced architecture is where you have taken your data path, say it's 32 bits, and you've split it up into equal portions. So in this case, they split it up into portions of four bits each. So you have eight slices. And the logic of each slice is identical. And there may be some combining logic that you do you know, later on in order to make the final 32-bit result. But in general, you consider only four bits at a time. Here is the ALU. Um, you can basically ignore everything else, but just concentrate on the ALU. And we can see that we've got four bits going in and another four bits going in. Those are our two inputs. We have a carry in and a carry out. We have a function over here, and you can see that they have three bits of function, which corresponds to these three bits right over here. We have a four bit output, and ignore all this stuff, a four bit output. We have an overflow bit, and we have a generate and propagate bit. So I'll get to generate and propagate in a moment. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take this 32-bit ALU block and expand it. So we now have a 4-bit ALU, and it's going to be repeated eight times. Now, the input to the first one is going to be x, 3 down to 0, and y, 3 down to 0. This, of course, is RS1 and RS2. So, you know, we could just call this X and Y. And also the function, function, we have a carry in and we have a carry out. Now, because the logic is identical, so all of these ALUs have to be the same, this ALU also has a carry in and a carry out. And it takes x from 7 down to 4, and y from 7 down to 4. So in other words, it takes the next four bits, but it also takes the, the whole function, because it needs to know what to do. And so on down the line, and the final one is x31 down to 28 and y31 down to 28, and the function. So all the f's are tied together. The uh, source register one is just you know split among all the ALUs, and, uh, our, and source two is also split among all the ALUs. Now, we could just leave it like this, and this might be familiar with those of you who are familiar with uh, digital design. Uh, we could actually just connect the carry out of the previous slice to the carry in of the next slice and just you know carry it through. Um, and this would be a ripple carry adder. So you would add x and y and carry in and you would output the result here. So we'll call this z, z. And of course this is going to be the destination 3 to 0. And this is the destination 7 to 4. And this goes to the destination bus 31 to 28. And the carry in and carry out just sort of chain together. So that way, um, the ALU together basically forms a 32 bit adder, also a 32 bit subtractor, because a subtractor is nothing but an adder, except you've taken the Y input and negated it. And we could do that negation internally. So it would also be the same thing with um, the logical operations, so and, or, and XOR, well, they don't depend on each other. So we could just you know, feed the results through and we're done. Uh, so add and subtract would require this uh, ripple carry and so would uh, comparison, uh, because in a comparison, we are actually going to end up doing a subtraction. So the problem is that if you were to implement this and each of these uh, ALUs has a delay which I'll call delta, 
then from the time that you input everything, there's going to be a time delta when you get the result carry out. And then you're going to have to wait another time delta from the carry in input to get the carry out output of this ALU, and so on and so forth, so that by the end you've got, what is it, 8 delta. Now there's a faster way to do this, and that is you don't chain the carry ins. You use what's called a carry look ahead unit, and what I'll do is I'll just draw it as a large box over here carry look ahead unit. And what happens is each ALU generates two signals called propagate and generate. Propagate and generate. Propagate and generate and so on. Propagate and generate. So the first thing is Propagate and generate are, are created strictly from the X and Y inputs. So in other words, they don't rely on the carry in. Now, what does propagate and, propagate and generate actually mean? If we look at any addition of two numbers, X plus Y, we can say that this will propagate a carry in if x plus y are such that a carry out will also be generated. Now that can only happen if x plus y is exactly 15. Remember x and y are 4-bit digits. If x plus y is less than 15, then it doesn't matter what carry in is because the output can never be greater than 15, which means that the carry out will always be 0. So in other words, if x plus y is less than or equal to, is, uh, is less than 15, we will not be propagating carry in, otherwise we will be propagating it. And a generate means that it doesn't matter what the carry in is, whatever x plus y is will definitely generate a carry in. Of course, that's if x plus y is greater than 15, because again, it doesn't matter what carry in is, you're going to generate a carry out. So that's what propagate and generate means. Now, the interesting thing is that carry out is just equal to, well, if you're going to generate a carry out, then that's your carry out, or carry in times the propagation bit. So in other words, if you're propagating a carry, then carry out is just going to be carry in. And that's all there is to it. So from this, you can see that we can easily generate this carry out based on x and y and also carry in. And you might think, well, you know, no big deal because of course I could generate this carry out from x and y and this carry in. But we're going to do this. Now, the propagate and carry bits here, again, only depend on this x and y, not the carry in. But to generate the next carry out is going to be equal to g, well, I'll call it the second stage, right? And then this carry out, I'll just call that carry one, plus the second stage p2. Now, if we expand this carry out, it's just g2 plus, and then g plus c in p times p2. And if we expand that out, the carry out is going to be g2 plus g p2 plus c in p p2. And if we go back to our block diagram, that means that this carry out depends only on this c in, these two propagate and generate bits, and these two propagate and generate bits. But these two bits only depend on x and y, so there's no chaining going on. Right now, there really isn't any advantage between a carry look ahead unit and ripple carry, because in order to get to this output here, I would have two delta in a ripple carry. And in order to get 
this carry out, let's see, we would have one delta generating the propagate and carry bits, uh, propagate and generate bits, one delta over here parallel, so overall we have one delta over here, and then this would have another delay of delta, so that's still two delta over here. However, that's it. All of the outputs of the carry lookahead unit all the way down to the very last carry out will only have this single delta delay plus one delta delay for, for these. So in other words, the very last carry out is generated after two delta. And of course, these sums are generated after, well, let's see. We generate the propagate and generate bits and you know the, the sum, although we're not going to pay attention to that yet, in delta time. Then we get another delta delay for all the carry inputs to be generated. Then we get a third delta to generate the actual sums. So each of these is three delta. So instead of eight delta, we now have three delta. So in other words, this is a faster way of generating a sum or a subtraction using a carry look ahead unit. So let's go back to the VAX architecture. And in fact, that's what they've done in the VAX. So they've split the ALU into eight four bit slices. And we have a carry in to the ALU and the carry out from the ALU. Uh, they also had intermediate ones because you could have um, nibbles, you could have bites, you could have half words and you could have whole words. So they had separate carry outs. We don't, of course, need that. And they have what they call a carry skipper unit, which is a carry look ahead unit. They actually had two, uh, but we are going to have one. So here's our carry look ahead unit. And we can see that from each of the ALUs, we will have two inputs. So that's already 16 inputs plus the carry in. So that's 17 inputs. And how many outputs do we have? Well, we have a carry out. What is it? Eight carry out units? Uh, eight carry outs. So we have eight outputs. So we would have some circuit that has 17 inputs and eight outputs, and that would just generate all of the carries all at once. So that's what our ALU is going to look like. Now we have to talk about how we're going to implement this 4-bit ALU and how we're going to implement this carry lookahead unit. Now there is a 4-bit ALU chip. It's the 74181. And there is a carry lookahead chip, 74182. There are a few disadvantages with this though. This is a TTL chip and it is only available in 5 volt TTL. Same thing with the 74182. Second of all, the 74181 has something like, I think a 500 nanosecond uh, propagation delay or a 400 nanosecond propagation delay. And that would really slow down our risk processor. It's slow enough because of course it's not on an FPGA. I'm building, building a RISC-5 processor, processor, not on an FPGA. FPGA. And there is no, as far as I can tell, four bit ALU in 3.3 volt logic. Same thing with the carry look ahead unit. So what we could do is we could just, you know, crack open the 4-bit ALU and, you know, stick down the logical gates and be done with it. But that's really complicated, and I have a one-chip solution. So first of all, how many inputs and outputs do each of these ALUs have? Well, there's four here, four here, that's eight, three here, and an additional one over here, so that's a total of 12. So 12 inputs each. And how many outputs? Well, there's four, five, six, seven. And I'm also going to add another one, and I'm going to call that the less than flag, less than. And I'll show how we use that later. But in any case, each of these ALUs has 12 inputs and eight outputs. Well, that can easily fit in a 4K by eight RAM or ROM, but RAMs are actually faster. And in terms of the 17, so this would be 128K by eight RAM. We can easily do that. 
Um, these are pretty cheap. Uh, here is, for example, a 32K by 8 RAM. This is a dollar. And it's 10 nanoseconds. So that's pretty cool. Um, here's another one. This is a 64K by 16 bit RAM. Uh, that's also about a dollar. And it's also 10 nanoseconds. So these RAMs are cheap. And we would need eight of these and one of these. And even though this is 128K, okay, let's suppose this is $2, right? So we're talking about a total of $10 for a full 32-bit ALU that has a delay of 30 nanoseconds. That's pretty good. So that's what I'm going to do. And the way to do that is you simply write a Python, simply I say, but you write a Python program which basically goes through all of the inputs, computes what the outputs are supposed to be, and then generates a file, and then you load that into, well, what do you load it into? You can't load it into RAM. So this brings me to bootstrapping. Now, bootstrapping is something that they did with the VAX. Uh, the VAX was a micro-instruction architecture, which basically meant that every instruction was a bunch of micro-instructions. And that definition was actually loaded into the VAX when it booted up. So that was the bootstrapping mechanism. So here we have our 4-bit ALU, which is actually 4K by 8. So we have 8 inputs and we have 12, uh, 8 outputs and 12 inputs. Well, what we really want to do is have a ROM that's 4K by 8 sitting up here. And the data lines get connected to here, probably through a buffer or an output enable. And we also have the address lines connected to the inputs of the ALU, also by a tri-state buffer. So that means that we could basically, you know, put the ROM in, do whatever it needs to, and then take the ROM out. Um, and then we have basically just, you know, uh, uh, I'll call it a loader. Really all it is is a counter. And it controls also these output enables and the right enable pin of each RAM. So the idea is that when we boot up, the loader uh, is enabled. The loader sets all of these tri-state buffers and it sets the right enable and it basically reads out the contents of this ROM and writes it to all of these RAMs. And of course for the ALUs, you can do that simultaneously. So we're going to do this and we're going to do this and so on down to the last ALU. Now, the reason that I have buffers in between each ALU is that during operation, of course, you want all of the outputs to be separated. However, because the logic is identical, you want them to all be loaded simultaneously. So when you load them simultaneously, all of these buffers are on and this ROM gets to write to all of these. Not that fast, um, each of these being 10 nanoseconds. Um, you can't actually read the ROM out um, with a cycle time of 10 nanoseconds. And besides, there's the delay of all these buffers. So you would be doing it a little slowly, so you know the bootstrap wouldn't be that fast. Um, and during operation, all of these are turned off, so all of these RAMs are basically separate. And you would do the same thing for the carry look-ahead unit, which is 128K by 8, and you would have a 128K by 8 ROM over here. And you would have the data lines here and the address lines here. And these address lines would be connected to these ALUs, and these data lines would also be connected to the carry ins of the ALUs. Um, and that's pretty much all there is to it. So that's my plan. In terms of these ROMs, I'm going to be using um, EEPROMs.
These are electrically erasable PROMs, programmable ROMs. Um, also, they are parallel because a lot of E squared PROMs today are actually serial because they're meant to, for example, configure an FPGA. I'm, I'm building, building a RISC-V processor, processor, not on, on an FPGA. FPGA. Uh, if I were to use serial ROMs, which are actually cheaper than parallel ROMs, um, then I would have to put in some shift registers over here, and that would just slow the thing down uh, immensely. So instead, I'm just going to use parallel ones. Um, and that's really the plan. I think that the next video is going to be about actually building one of these, um, probably building uh, the ALU and building two of them, maybe in their ROM versions, uh, and then, you know, just breadboarding it and making sure that it does what I think it does. Um, and then, of course, building the cards for the ALU and carry look-ahead unit. And that will be the arithmetic and logical operations. There's still shifting to be done, and that will certainly be the subject of another video as well. So until then, I hope you enjoyed that, and I'll see you on the next video. Bye. I'm building a RISC-V processor, not on an FPGA.